on them. So it's with great pleasure I introduce Mark Van Gills, who I met in Helsinki this week at a workshop on uh, AI and, uh, and open technologies where Mark spoke about healthcare. So over to you, Mark, introduce yourself in whatever way you okay. wish. <laughs> Thank you very much, Susan, for the kind invitation. So yes, indeed, I, I, uh, I held a presentation about how to use more artificial intelligence and, and more yeah. data analytics methods in, in healthcare. Uh, my background is that I'm, I'm a principal scientist at FITI which is a technical research center of, of Finland and I've been working since 20 years in how to basically applying data analysis methods which include uh, well signal processing image processing and of course more modern approaches that where we use data mining approaches um, sometimes rule-based sometimes mathematical models and of course also neural networks and and more deep learning networks nowadays more and more i did my phd in, in the mid 90s when the neural networks were in fashion as well but then we had of course more possibilities. So what i will tell today is is more practical insights of, of what we do when we are, are applying data analysis methods in healthcare applications and we work together especially with, with hospitals mainly in, in international projects so so typically european size projects in which we have hospitals from different countries participating and uh, we are then helping to solve problems like for example early dementia diagnostics or tra traumatic brain injury assessment of the risk for a patient or cardiac patients assessing whether they are on their way to recovery or whether there are certain risk development at home. So it, it's really the idea is that we combine lots of data and help clinicians solve real life problems. That's, that's the main thing. So we are not a university in the sense that we are would be doing theoretical research. We are really re applying the type of methods that, that we that others typically have developed at least at, at fundamental level and, and then we are seeing how it can be done in practice and, and what kind of problems you run into. So uh, this is now really a very short version of what I, I uh, had as lecture two days ago, which was a lecture of two hours, and I now I basically have less than half an hour, so I'm pretty sure that <laughs> the number of slides is, is way more than I can explain, but let's see how far we get, and, and we might even continue in a later, later lecture if there is need to. But I will try to, to share with you some of the ideas and, and things that we run in, have run into the, during those 20 years. So basically I will tell a bit what, what's the difference between using artificial intelligence or, or data analytics in general in healthcare, why is it different than, than other types of applications, so why is it different than using it in industry or in banking or, or other settings. And I will then highlight some practical problems that we always run into when we use health data and and show how we have been, been working on those as one suggestion for a solution. And if I need to explain to people what, what, uh, what it is that the healthcare data analysis makes it so special, well, of course, you start with, with the toolboxes that you have at hand. So it can be some kind of um, R packages or, or Python uh, basic packages. We use MATLAB. Uh, sometimes we have nowadays things like TensorFlow and more advanced methods. It doesn't really matter to do uh, we typically don't tie ourselves to one approach we, we use a whole toolbox of different types of methods sometimes simple statistical methods are enough regression or, or sometimes we use rule based but independent of that we have a, a set of pretty, pretty generic tools that we typically start from and then of course we have input vectors that are typically data measured from humans in our case we have a some kind of targets that those methods should reach, some, something that you should measure your performance against. So it, it could be, for example, that you want to classify data, whether this person has a certain disease, yes or no. So then you have some kind of two-class classification problems. Sometimes we have much more complex things, but you need to, to find something there. And then finally, you, of course, need to implement your system in practice, and it has to be used by a a user who is not an engineer or a data scientist, so it's a, typically a, a healthcare professional and they are, of course, bound to all kinds of processes, things that, that 
are relevant. So they, they have requirements with respect to usability, but also how you can get access to the data, legislation, ethical issues, privacy issues. There's all kind of things that are not directly related to the classification problem at hand, but sometimes they can influence what kind of data that you can use. So they do then set limits to, to what kind of methods that are in practice usable. And okay, the data, as I will show today, is if we are dealing with health data, it's especially one big problem is that the data is, is quite often riddled with artifacts or noise or there's missing data, uh, there's, there's statistical complications if you probably want to consider that people are really different. So we have inter-individual variants, intra-individual variants, etc., etc. Um, at the outputs, we also have quite many complications. Quite often, it's not sure what the right answer should be. Different clinicians might have different opinions. There's quite a lot of subjective reasoning, and sometimes it's, it's just impossible to say what exactly the disease is. So for example, we have um, different types of dementias and you cannot really know the exact dementia until the person actually has uh, uh, was deceased and you could do some pathological research. So there's, there's sometimes you are not even able to, 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 to give the right answer. And then healthcare environment by itself is, is very challenging. The processes, legislation, reimbursement models, they all influence on what you can do and, and they really are difficult things for, for us data scientists to, to take into account into the development process. Uh, so there are, of course, many applications that we could use AI in. Um, here are a few of them mentioned, but there are certainly more. So, so trying to get personalized medicine, as it's called nowadays, so trying to make better interventions uh, really targeted at an individual, not at group level, but really taking into account what, what a, a person's background is. So you could combine health data with genetic information and other types of, of things from the patient history. So really specifying what, what kind of care plans that you need to take. Uh, we use data analytics a lot in, in making the, the clinician's life easier by taking taking care of certain time-consuming and, and maybe even tedious jobs like uh, things that have been done in, in the past, maybe visually like, like image analysis, segmenting data, uh, recognizing certain structures and images, looking at, at signals like EEG, signal processing, extracting certain features there. So it's, it's really there the idea is that we can take some of the dirty work out of the hands of clinicians and then there are things in, that are more and more important going outside of the hospital, going to so-called citizen-centric care that you want to monitor people as much as possible, as long as possible, and really look at, for example, trends, not only in hospital, but, but also during daily living at home and try to detect early when things might go wrong. And then there are many more applications for example, process optimization in the hospital, uh, automization of, 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 of administrative tasks and those type of things, but I will, I will leave them untouched here for the, for the sake of, of time. So if we look at, at what kind of data that we have, uh, data from humans is of course what, uh, what, what as I already mentioned, this is what we get typically as input and there we have the issue that people are different obviously which means that it's, it's not really proper to put everything into one database and, and, and compare, for example, my heart rate to, to somebody else's heart rate because we typically have different types of, of personal, personal ranges which are normal for us. But also those normal ranges, even at the personal level, might change very well over time. So it, 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 it doesn't necessarily mean that if my blood pressure today is higher than it was yesterday, that there is something wrong with me. It may be due to all kinds of normal variations. Maybe I, I slept too little or I'm maybe a bit nervous for giving a presentation or all kinds of things that, that just are changing over time and, and changing that normal level, even during daily, daily time spent, so to say. So that's, a, that's a, if you want to, to make classifiers or make decisions, of course, you could, could have the tactic saying, okay, I don't really care if I have tens of thousands of cases or hundreds of thousands of cases, and then with enough examples, I, I can have some smart input output model that gives good, good answers. 
um, of course, that's that's one way to do it. And there are certain applications in which that actually is working reasonably. For example, in, in certain sports applications or things that are not so critical with respect to health. But of course, if we are dealing with, with patient data, we need to be very careful and ensure that we are doing the right thing. So for healthcare applications by themselves, we typically use more advanced methods. So really looking at so-called stratification, personalization methods in which we try to figure out what is the personal level and what is the normal for a given individual in order to be able to to provide the, the right type of, of conclusions. So we could use statistics. There's lots of statistical background on how to deal with different patients in a data set, uh, how to deal with things like partial correlations and then taking those things properly into account using regression properly if you have different people. Uh, of course, there are those type of standard ways of harmonizing or normalizing the data, I should say, that, that are available in all kinds of toolboxes that we have. So you can scale to the minimum and the maximum and, and maybe we scale it back to normal distributions with a zero mean and unit variance. But what we usually use is we divide people into certain groups and we then develop specialized models for those different groups. So we call that stratification with a, with a more fancy word. So you could, for example, think about different age groups. So if we have certain physiological models, then we know that certain parts of the body change with age or, or certain processes change as people get older. Uh, so it's not really fair to compare values that you have measured from a person with a high age to those of a younger age, because inevitably there will be differences and they are not necessarily related to a disease. So age, uh, gender, education is sometimes used, for example, in, in, in studies or projects in which you are dealing with cognitive tests. So for example, dementia or other types of things in which people that have had a longer education actually have a let's say more resilience or a bigger buffer against uh, tests that measure memory loss, for example. So those type of things you can, you can use there. And sometimes we use alternative approaches. We don't group them into different bins, but we use regression to, to correct for changes in variables that happen over time with ages. And I will show in a moment a slide about that. And a histogram is at last bullet there, which is, a, is another type of thing that we can, can use as corrections for. So this is an example of, of a dementia study in which we try to predict whether people that had memory complaints, whether they actually were at risk of developing full dementia in a few years. And one typical biomarker that we use there is the volume of the hippocampus, which is one, one part of the brain. And that dot here that you see at, at age of 68, let's say that that is the volume of the current person that we want to analyze and we would like to, to decide whether that's a, a small volume or a large volume. Well, in order to make that conclusion, we need to compare it to the reference database. So thousands of people that we have measured earlier and you can do that. And if you do that kind of things, you need to take into account that, that people's hippocampus volume decreases with age regardless of whether you have dementia, yes or no. So you see those blue, yellow, red curves there that are representing uh, statistical distributions. So basically calculated from a large database and you can see that for the normal population from which they were calculated, you can see that, okay, the, the hippocampus volume stays pretty constant until the mid fifties and then it decreases regardless of, of whether there's dementia, yes or no. So this is really normal, normal data. So then the question that you can ask, okay, this person at 68, of course, it looks that he has really a significantly smaller hippocampus volume than the normal population. Uh, that's clear in this case, but for example, if you would have compared it, if he would have been 88, then it, it would have been a bit more vague to make that kind of decision. So you can use this type of regression models to to make more informed decisions for your classifier, really correcting for the age correctly. And we have done that kind of things on, on, on larger databases. So in the Netherlands, we have had a, a very large data set for tens of thousands of people that have been followed over time and, and different biomarkers have been used there and there. You can really make models of how certain structures of the brain or other types of biomarkers change over time. And this is now an example of an observation that increases with, with age. And you can see that, okay, if we have a person 
of age 70 coming in and we would like to classify to which group this person belongs and we have lots of data in the database at all kinds of different ages measured how do we then compare that to that that value of that person of 70 well we use regression curves from probability density functions that we have calculated from all those data that we have and we can look at what the, the closest curves are and, and do a regression back to that 70 years so that we have a, a bit more proper comparison model there. So those type of things are, are useful for improving performance without, let's say, brute force learning. It really already helps to, to use this type of, of knowledge directly. Uh, other approaches are that we sometimes use statistical distributions uh, for at, at personal level combined with group level. So over here you have two examples of, of data or of heart rate from a, a given patient in a, in a hospital setting. So there you would like to make patient monitoring settings that are personalized. So raise an alarm when there is really something wrong for that person and not, not on, the, on the group threshold like it's normally used. So here you see patient 34 has a, has a heart rate, which is around 60. Patient 45 has a heart rate, which is around 80. Around, And then you have a database on the background, the red curve, uh, which is showing, of course, that there is much more variation over different individuals. And on the right-hand side, you see that that's an example of one person who has a heart rate, but who has a much bigger variability in the heart rate than the other ones. So if you want to normalize those type of things, of course, you can normalize the range and, and go from zero to one and, and have some, some kind of basic model. But you would need to choose whether you want to, to take the, the whole database, the background database, or whether you actually look at the data of this individual only. And what we do in practice is actually we make a combination of the two. So we we have our group database with all the heart rates from, from hundreds of people on the background, uh, but we also measure the heart rate of that person since the beginning of the recording, for example, or maybe over the last hour or the last day, and have that individual distribution there as well. And then we use a linear combination of those two. So with certain weights, in this case, it's 0 0.7 times the group plus 0 0.3 times the individual distribution, and you can of those distribution, you can calculate the cumulative distribution, which is that bottom figure there. And what you then do is you measure a certain value and you see where it fits into that cumulative distribution, which then gives you a value between zero and 100%, which is then your normalized value. So it, it takes into account both what is, is normal or usual for the group of people, but also you take into account what is, what is this individual's own value. And of course, the trick is then to to decide what are those values of A and B, because that's of course, it depends a bit on, on what kind of application that you have and how much value do you want to put into those, into those different components there. Uh, and then another major headache is, is missing an incomplete data. Of course, we have lots of missing data. If we are aiming to combine, for example, imaging data with blood tests and genetic tests and, and maybe interviews and, and cognitive memory test, then typically what we aim for is some kind of big table in which we have rows of different patients and columns that are then the different observations. And ideally we would have all cells filled, but in practice we always have lots of missing data. So it's very rare that we have complete data sets from, from, from everybody. So there's, that's one of those things that is, is in practice we will always run into and, and try to deal with. And of course, then you can make choices uh, uh, quite often in, in many other disciplines, people are using the kind of logic that we only use complete cases and delete all the, the things that have uh, not a number or missing values. If we would do that in our application, we would really have only very little data left. So it's, it's in health cases, typically we have rarely more than 10 or 20% of the data that actually has all those values, especially if we are really de dealing with very diverse databases coming from different sources, from maybe from, from, uh, from a hospital and from, from a family doctor or some own measurements done at home. If you want to combine everything like that, then it really gets very tricky to get complete data sets. Uh, of course, the opposite you could say, let's just impute all the data, make some, some interpolations, averages, and that kind of things. You could do that to some extent, but then if you want to do clustering or looking at, at what kind of data properties there are, you 
of course are are kind of smearing out the effects that you would like to study so that's not the optimal idea either um, we have used quite often the kind of rule of thumb that that if there is less than 70 percent in an input vector uh, valid values then you leave them out if there is more than 70 percent then okay we can start thinking about imputing or, or making some educated guesses of what the, what the data could be again this is a, this is a, a rule of thumb but 70 percent is has been working quite reasonably but you need to do really those type of things in, in, in a very close discussion with, with clinicians to make sure that it makes actually sense there uh, there are, of course, some tools that are designed to, to, to work with missing data. So C-means clustering is one example, and we have developed in, within VTT one, one method that we use in many cases, which we call the disease state index, which maybe someday I, I can spend another lecture on if that's interesting. But the, So there are certain approaches in, in, in which you have classifiers that actually are able to elegantly deal with missing data. But they are perhaps a bit, a bit less well known. Um, missing data and time series. Uh, so there you have gaps in the data on the time axis also happening quite often if there is, for example, noise or artifacts or things that, that, that break down the connection, for example. Uh, you can try to fix that by, by using regression, uh, spline interpolation, but that's really something that you really need to discuss very clearly with the clinician because sometimes you might end up with something that looks nice to the eye but it doesn't have any clinical clinical meaning or it's, it's, it's just removing the things that actually are clinically relevant. And it's good to remember here that actually even if we think that missing data is a bad thing, sometimes the fact that there is missing data is actually worthwhile by itself. So you could think for the, for example, of a, of a situation in which we are measuring at home. We are instructing, for example, people to, to measure blood pressure every day or measure their heart rate uh, or maybe measure weight and the idea is that they would do that every day and um, sometimes it happened that they are not doing it every day anymore there might be gaps in the data and actually the fact that there are gaps sometimes might be a result of the fact that people people's health situation is changing it can be that they are not feeling well or they are not motivated or there's some something else that is worth noting so actually the fact that there is missing data sometimes is, is a really useful information by itself so this is an example of a study that we did um, in which people were on a weight change so weight reduction type of program and the idea was that there uh, people would, would measure their weight every day and you can see the different the different error bars there so the top one is with people actually that were really doing their daily daily measurements nicely as they, they agreed to do and, and indeed those people actually lost a bit of their weight but you can see that if you go to the lower error bars there 637 163 47 measurements there people that are weighing less often more infrequent actually they they actually had the result that their weight was increasing so there is there's really a some information there to be gained from the, the fact that people are not not really measuring all the all the times as they should be. So it's it's not necessarily always the case that missing data is a bad thing. And the same with noise and, and artifacts that I don't have time now to go much into that, but actually sometimes they really contain very useful information. Okay. I'm now, let's say, five minutes before the half hour. There's really lots of more things that I could go into detail about, which actually I'm, I'm happy to, to spend another lecture on sometime later. It doesn't really make much sense to rush, but there's, there's many more considerations that we could discuss, for example, whether it's, it's really needed in healthcare applications to have explainable models, which like is quite often uh, discussed and, and and if you think about neural networks they are quite often things th thought about as, as black box or, or at least difficult to interpret uh, interpret boxes um, the consequences of, of using those type of things um, performance measurements how do you assess performance of, of, of data uh, analysis methods in clinical practice of course we have the, the precision and the recall but there are many other types of things that you need to think about if you really want to introduce methods in in health applications that I could tell about as well. So instead of rushing it 
now here, which probably won't work. I'm happy to, to, to continue with the series sometime later, but yeah, maybe this is a, this is a good moment to, to have a, a break here and, and this. Thank you very much, Mark. So um, if anybody has any quick questions, um, and, and I'll schedule a follow-up in the next few weeks. Any, any quick questions from anyone? Or put in the question in the chat. Okay, we have some thank yous. Um, yeah, it's nice to see thank yous if you enjoyed what you heard so far. Um, please post in the chat. And any questions before Mark leaves us? I see no questions. Oh, great overview. Yes, the slides are posted on the CSIG website. Let me give you the CSIG website in the chat, um, as are all the talks and the recording will be posted there too. Um, so if you, I'll just get you the, the link to it. Or if somebody else can get the link quickly, that would be great. Could someone get the CSIG website um, link and post it in the chat? Uh, the slides are there also, everything's there, recording's there. Anybody, can end somebody on the call post it? I don't see anyone posting it, I guess I'll have to. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, people are wanting the follow-up. And, oh yes, here you go. So people have posted the, the link, thank you. Thank you, dear person. Okay, yeah, predictive modeling. Yeah, I'm happy to talk, to talk more about that, of course, in detail. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it was tied. I think you tied it for putting yes, and people another talk to go into. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you, everyone. I'll, uh, you'll be in time for your next meeting, Mark. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Well, let's yeah, just uh, agree some sometime. Yes, yeah. to, 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 yeah, to continue. I don't think you'll actually complete it, even in part two. <laughs> no, there's lots of information to be told, but let's, yeah. Yeah, let's see. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us, and we'll have another call next week.